One, two, three. Uh, good morning and good evening, everyone, wherever you are in the world. Today we have a special uh, session. Uh, we can call it as a digital fireside chat. We can call it as a podcast as part of the Center for Management of Health Services at IIM Ahmedabad. And our special guests today are Professor Anita McGahan, uh, who is an university professor, professor of strategic management, professor at the Monk School of Global, Global Affairs and Public Policy, and also the George Conwell Chair in Organizations and Society at the Rotman School of Management in University of Toronto. She's joining us from Massachusetts. Um, joining Anita is also somebody as scholarly and most work you know in strategic management, Professor Will Mitchell, Anthony S. Fell Chair in New Technologies and Commercialization, Professor of Strategic Management. Will is also the co-director of the Global Executive MBA for Healthcare and Life Sciences. Uh, all of this at the Rotman School of Management in the University of Toronto. Uh, I don't want to take too much of your time to belabor on your huge influence on global scholarship in this area. But today, we have a special agenda to chat about the new book on private sector entrepreneurship in global health. Uh, our mandate is to start off with some slides that Will and Anita have for us. And then we will open up for a question and answer on these issues around how private, in, in private entrepreneurship can solve frictions in global, global health, both on the demand and supply side. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Anita and Will, for joining us for this discussion. Charanton, thank you so much for, for organizing this and, wel and welcoming us so, so kindly. Um, it's wonderful to be here. It's wonderful to connect with you all. And, and this is an opportunity to talk about the book we published, talk about the work we've done, do, been doing, and, um, and about the passion that I know we share with all the people on this call uh, to really understand global health and not only understand global health, uh, but to be agents in helping advance global health. And this is a book that reflects work that we've done with co our co-editors, Anil Bhattacharya and Kate Mo Mossman, um, and with many co-authors, our students, our colleagues, our friends um, at the University of Toronto and around the world. And really appreciate the opportunity to talk briefly about it. And then I talk with you with some, some Q&A and, and some ideas ar around the book. Um, I'll kick off with a few basic ideas and then turn it over to Anita um, to expand. And Thank you. You know, we'll, do, we'll do a little bit of framing. Uh, we'll talk about some examples in our book. And, and we'll spend some, possibly spend some time on general issues. And especially, most importantly, we'll spend some time with you uh, and talking about the ideas that, that you all have. Um, about global health and opportunities to, to increase our understanding and improvements. And, and one thing to start with is, is to be, be honest, that there's been real improvements um, over the last 30 to 40 to 50 years. And there's a couple of indicators of life expectancy, which has gone up, um, and infant mortality, which has gone down. And both of those are really amazingly good trends. Um, there's lots to do, and we'll talk about that. Uh, but let's be clear that there really have been big improvements in things in many countries and many communities around the world for many people. Um, and one of the questions is why? And you know, there's lots of reasons. Um, some of it's international health and civil society. Um, some of it's educational institutions. Some of it's technology. Um, some of it's people flow, move, people moving across borders and bringing, bringing benefits with them. And some of it is commerce, the private sector. And by private sector, we mean both nonprofit and for-profit organizations that have engaged with health around the world, um, engaged with health in, 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 in local communities, and made real improvements. And, and if we think about you know, what our role is at this point, um, part of it is just don't screw it up. Um, let's make things <laughs> sure that things keep continuing. Uh, keep building. Um, and, and third, uh, particularly now as we're talking in, in May 2020, um, don't regress post COVID. And, and let's be honest, there has been regression. There are children, there are families who are sick, who are, who are hungry, who are dying now as we speak. Um, because of COVID problems and because we're not because of lack of responsiveness to the COVID challenges, and there's lots. It's going to take huge partnerships of individuals, of civil society, of public organizations, of private organizations, um, to deal with that. Um, and a book, can, to some extent, would help with that. Um, Anita, let me let, let me turn it over to you at this point and and talk a little bit about why you why your sense of what we've learned from the book around the role of Public, of, pub, non, of private sector organizations, both nonprofit organizations and, and for-profit organizations um, in, 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 in bringing improvements to, to health in different organizations around and communities around the world. 
I would say that uh, the private sector, the private sector has not, um, it has not fulfilled its uh, capacity. It's has not amplified and sustained and, and achieved the scale the impact that it can have, especially in private healthcare and private healthcare delivery. There's a lot more development uh, that has to happen, I think, in the private sector for us to fulfill that potential. And we're seeing that with COVID, I think, right now. Uh, you know, there's been all sorts of questions about the efficiency of the supply chain, its effectiveness, uh, the challenges of achieving resiliency in the supply chain. But for us in this book, the real question is point of care delivery at the level of patients. How do we uh, achieve the kind of impact that the private sector can deliver? So uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, progress that's been made, as Will suggests, a lot of lessons that we can learn from what's been accomplished. Uh, and we'll talk in a minute about a case study on North Star to just to illustrate some of that insight and some of that potential, uh, but also a long uh, roadway, a long uh, way forward there. Uh, in NGOs and in uh, the, uh, the not-for-profit sector, I think there's been uh, greater advances. We've we, many of these NGOs play very sort of scaled, sustainable roles in different types of health systems, a critical role that will continue. And there I see uh, a change not so much uh, ahead of us, uh, not so much in, you know, how they interact and what they do, but in, um, in, in, in new ways that NGOs can emerge in complementary sectors to core healthcare delivery that will be important. Thanks, Will. Cool. So just a few, I'll, I'll leave this. So let me, so, so our book, some of the, some, so what, what, are we, what were we able to look at? Um, we're able to look at some verticals, tuberculosis, malaria, diabetes, uh, maternal child health, mental health. There, there's wonderful examples from around the world in many continents, many countries. Um, we're able to, to integrate across some of that, to look at, and to look at integration, integrating primary care and maternal health. Uh, looking at ICT, which is essentially an integrative technology, um, looking at organizations that are moving, able to move across across countries and gain, gain at least some degree of transnational national scale, and to look at some of the learnings from lower middle income countries and, and high and higher income countries, and with the with the knowledge flowing both ways, um, flowing to some some extent from higher income to to to, to lower middle income, but also flowing back, um, and not even just back, flowing one way from starting out. In, uh, in in lower middle income settings and flowing back into Canada and the U.S. and other uh, other other higher income settings, um, and we're able to do some work. We were able to do some work on performance measurement, both especially setting up some scales uh, for measuring meaningful performance. Um, and here's a few examples: um, innovative practices. Um, Uganda, there's a living goods franchise, uh, which uh, you know uses and it uses training, uses brand, uses supply, using loans to support door-to-door -door health education. Um, in Nigeria, Hygieia Community Microinsurance uses a partnership in Holland um, to provide basic and specialist service. Um, in Latin America, Maurice Dopes International. Um, in Bolivia, has 100,000 clients, six centers, five mobile clinics um, that supports reproductive and sexual health services. And Maurice Dopes is in many countries around the world. Um, in India, Narayana Hospitals um, has training and partnerships for multi-specialty hospitals, heart centers, primary care, really a stunning example. Of, of, of huge impact on, on, on human health. Um, there's examples from maternal and child health um, in Thailand, the Population and Community Development Association, which uses social marketing campaigns um, for family planning cl clinics. In Mexico, Nepal, and China, um, there's a One Heart Worldwide, uh, which trains community, community members, healthcare providers, and outreach workers, and in turn does that, to use that to support OB and neonatal care. Uh, in Pakistan, Green Star Social Marketing, which uses a voucher system for reproductive health systems. And then, um, you know, lots of other examples, mobile money, microinsurance, franchising, tailoring services for the poor, vouchers. Um, and as Nita said, there's, there's, let's, let's spend a couple of minutes on, on a slightly more, uh, slightly longer example. This is North Star Alliance, um, based in operating in multiple countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, using what it calls a blue box model based on, on, on transport containers. Um, to bring to bring uh, health services to mobile workers um, across multiple countries in Africa, and it's basically, its clients are um, at risk are, are people who are at risk: uh, truck drivers and commercial sex workers um, in, who in, in along long tr transport corridors. 
Um, it uses a containerized model. It's converted into medical clinics. It's quick to set up um, and to clean. There's a very lean staffing model. They have a clinical officer, an HIV counselor, receptionist, a security guard, and peer educators. Um, and, it's, as it's, and it's transnational. because the, the, the trucks drive across countries. You need to provide services across countries. It's along transport corridors. There's an electronic health passport that's synchronized across countries. Um, 2017, it was in 38 countries, uh, or th 38 clinics rather, in 10 countries. Um, but 2019, since its founding in 2006 in Utrecht, um, it was at 22 clinic centers in West Africa, East Africa, and Southern Africa, 200,000 people annually, more than 2 million health sessions to date, um, and supporting dozens of clinics run, run by other health service groups and by health ministries. And this is very much um, a private organization that has a public sector um, engagement. And it's, it's really interesting to look at North Star's value chain and the research we did. Um, because it's, it, it's a whole mix of partnerships, uh, partnerships with donors at the funding stage, um, with suppliers at the clinics, uh, with governments and corporates at the re for real estate and private owners, uh, permits with the Ministry of Health, staffing um, with the Ministry of Health. So partnerships as you build the value chain. And then partnerships as you move towards the client. Uh, partnerships for supplies, partnerships with, with corporate foundations for finding clients, partnerships for marketing, um, partnerships for data management, um, and ultimately partnerships with Ministry of Health uh, for delivery. And so it's, it's what we call a value chain integration model where North Star is playing the lead, taking the lead in build, building partnerships and managing coordinating partnerships with multiple actors along the value chain in order to deliver high value services um, to, to clients who really need the, re, really need the, who really need the services. Um, and I'll, my last slide, and I'll turn this over to, to Anita again. If we, when we looked across across the examples, looked across what we've learned. Um, one, of the, one of the takeaways is it's just a flexible variety. And one of the powers of the private sector organizations, again, this is true whether you're for-profit or non-profit, um, is the opportunity for flexibility, uh, for being able to respond quickly to need, respond quickly to opportunities. And, but within that variety and within that flexibility, there's at least four elements that really strike us as being core um, to making this work. One is it's a combination of medical and management skills. You can't just do it with great medical skills. It takes management. Um, it takes the basic fundamental nuts and bolts of making organizations work, understanding clients, being able to put, build organizations that deliver services to clients in ways that they need and will engage with. Um, second is the financial skills are nuanced. It's not just grant writing. Um, it's not just you know, filling out an, 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 responding to an RFP from a foundation um, and getting the money and spending it. It takes really thoughtful financial skill um, in, in raising and managing money. Third is that there's a really strong sense of, of partnership skills. No one of us can do it alone. And, and, but just setting up a partnership, just saying, we, just saying we have a partnership isn't enough. Um, we really have to be engaged and manage and coordinate um, and build the alliances uh, with, a re with a really vast array of partnerships. Getting, if, and, and getting goals aligned and then working together with those goals. And, and fourth, it takes a market focus. Uh, it has to be tailored to the local context. Um, it can't be a one size fits all. And it really has to focus on the needs of local individuals. And so this is the, one of the, the things we took away from this is that successful private sector organizations are ones who, don't, who, who, who have a supply side understanding but don't bring a supply side mentality to their services. They bring a demand side mentality to their services. Who are the individuals that need the care? How do they ag aggregate in the communities? Um, what is the concept what's the local context in which they're operating and how, how can we do that? I mean, let me let me end with one simple example. Um, there's a public sector organization in a country we looked at um, that was that was putting up clinic weekly clinics in in the communities in which it was operating and in one community it was putting the clinics on Thursdays and they only had a cycle and they, so, so, so in one community it happened to be Thursdays and the problem with that 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 setting was that people came into the community on Fridays for markets and uh -huh. The clinic sat there empty on Thursdays mm -hmm. and they shut it down. And a private sector organization came in and said, well, if people are coming to the markets on Fridays, we're going to put up the clinics on Fridays. And of course, people come to, their, come to the markets and they also came to the clinic. And so that greater flexibility and the greater understanding of the local context was resulted in success that the early organization hadn't been able to do, partly because it didn't understand the local community um, and partly because um, it didn't have enough focus on, on the needs of the individuals there. 
Nita, let me turn it to you um, and talk, ask you to talk about some of the, 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 the broader framing on this. Well, thank Will, you, thanks Will. A lot. Will, thanks a lot. Well, thanks, Trotton and Will. Great. Well, my motivation for um, engaging in writing this book really reflected uh, my experiences both on working with the T Hope team, uh, including Will and many others, as he described, over a period of about 10 years, we wanted to consolidate that knowledge, but also drawing on uh, experiences that I had had working in other uh, organizations and observing other organizations that had been uh, tremendously effective in improving lives. So I just wanted to acknowledge that um, the agenda for this book, while rooted in those original case studies, also is giving way to uh, other insights that reflect other experiences. Will, would you mind please advancing the slide? Bingo. Uh, I had done uh, a, uh, some work in Kenya with a group of students uh, in a town called Kasumu, which is on Lake Victoria uh, to the to the west side of uh, Kenya here. Please advance. Mm -hmm. And on, uh, after traveling with a group of students uh, to Kenya a couple of years ago, I was on an airplane on the way back uh, to the United States uh, from Kenya, sitting next to a student. And he shared with me what he was writing in his journal. And this is what he wrote. He wrote, the need is for healthcare is almost unlimited, but we made so little difference in the projects that we did. Mm. Why were our projects so watered down and ineffective? What did we miss? What could we have done better? Could you please advance, Will? And as I thought about this, I realized that this problem of trying to improve health delivery in resource limited places such as Kasumu and uh, in many places in India reflects a fundamental paradox that we need to overcome in order to have greater impact. And to illustrate that paradox, I've made a note here that global expenditures on health, and this is data is a little bit old, it's about five years old. Uh, now it's uh, more than this, but just to take it as a benchmark, um, about five years ago, it was about $10.5 trillion uh, here. If you advance, please. Uh, if you think about spending, the, uh, take that $10.5 trillion, divide it by the number of people um, uh, uh, who receive access to that healthcare in uh, around the world, what you find is tremendous inequity. In other words, tremendous differences across countries and how that $10.5 million is spent. Uh, uh, the, um, the maximum amount spent per capita is about 9,674 uh, uh, US dollars. That was uh, spent in the, about five years ago in Switzerland. Um, uh, here now we see some countries, including the United States, spending more than ten thousand dollars per person per year on healthcare, and that's 2019 data before COVID. But let's run a thought experiment. Imagine that if you that you spent nine thousand six hundred and seventy-four dollars per person everywhere in the world. In other words, let's say you were to close the gap between Switzerland and Kisumu, Kenya, in healthcare delivery you would have to spend $72 trillion globally on healthcare to close that gap. And US GDP, as we'll see on the next slide, uh, 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 sorry, global GDP, as we'll see on the next slide, is uh, about the same amount, $73 trillion. In other words, <clears throat> the fundamental problem that that student was writing about on that airplane on the way home from Kasumu, Kenya, reflected the global economics of closing the gap between the rich and the poor in healthcare. The fundamental problem is, as soon as we try to implement our system, the system that we're familiar with in Canada and the United States and Switzerland, uh, the, the, the healthcare system that we have here, as soon as we try to implement those practices in places such as Kasumu and perhaps some places uh, of poverty in India, we run into the same problem. We, we run out of supplies, we run out of medicines, we run out of critical um, staff, we run out of uh, equipment, PPE, and so on. And, and that problem cannot be solved structurally with the system that we have today. In other words, if our ambition in healthcare and global health is to close the gap by providing the same healthcare system that we have in Canada and so on, in Switzerland, to everyone in the world, we don't have enough resources to do that. We can hardly afford our healthcare system in places of wealth, much less uh, expect that they can be paid for in places of poverty. So that leads us and me in particular to this question of how do we innovate in our healthcare system to overcome that structural problem? We have to reduce 
the expense of the system, we have to make sure that it stops getting more expensive, and we have to crucially remediate this inequality problem because it's simply unfair that 84% of healthcare dollars are spent in wealthier countries. Please advance. So uh, the system that we have is, uh, is unsustainable and unfair, and the system that we want, it, it should be smart, fair, humane, thoughtful, and efficient. We could spend a lot of time with business ethicists talking about what our criteria should be for what a great healthcare system uh, should be, but th those are the five that, uh, that are guiding my thinking and the, uh, the T-Hope thinking overall. We want these things, these systems to to be smart, fair, humane, thoughtful, and efficient, both uh, medically uh, and uh, uh, managerially, but also socially and 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 on humanitarian grounds, we want uh, our our system to be uh, to be uh, not just efficient, which is what we've been pressed to do uh, in recent decades in healthcare, but also smart, fair, humane, and thoughtful. Well, thank you. Would you advance, please? So, you know. From 30,000 feet, where we are, I think, is that we have different challenges in the different categories uh, that are represented on this slide, which reflect causes of illness and death. The first is injuries, which account for about 12% of global deaths. Second is non-communicable diseases, such as heart attacks, uh, cancers, and so on, which account for about um, uh, half, a little less than half of global diseases. And then on the right-hand side, communicable maternal, perinatal, and nutritional conditions, including infectious diseases like COVID, malaria, tuberculosis, HIV, which uh, until uh, 2019 accounted for uh, about 38% uh, or so of global deaths uh, here. Now, the, the, the high level message that I wanna send in closing, and this will be my last slide, is to say that the system that we have in resource uh, rich settings such as Canada, oh, would you mind going back please? I'm just gonna end with this slide. The system that we have in research rich settings such as Canada and Switzerland, for addressing injuries is both, it, it tends to meet our five criteria. There's still still steps that we can take to make things better, of course, um, but we have a relatively robust system that's smart, fair, thoughtful, humane, and efficient for uh, delivering uh, care on injuries and injuries. And again, there's more that we can do, but for example, we could redesign roads, car accidents, there's a lot of work to do on the opioid crisis and so on to make sure that we're delivering medicine appropriately. Uh, accidental deaths from op opioid overdose just outpaced car accidents as the major cause of injury, but in general injuries uh, are well uh, supported by our system. Will, would you mind please going ahead to the, we can just stay on this slide um, if, if, if that's okay. So non-communicable diseases, cardiovascular disease, cancer, and respiratory disease, this is where our system uh, is, is not effective, in my opinion. We, we, the problem here is that it's good, but good is becoming the enemy of great. And there's a tremendous amount to learn from private sector innovations in places such as India, uh, Haradalai Heart Hospital, um, there's uh, lots of examples, North Star, on how to try to address non-communicable diseases more effectively on my criteria of smart, thoughtful, humane, uh, fair, and efficient. Um, lots of innovation where in, in settings such as Canada and, uh, and uh, Switzerland, we can learn from resource limited uh, settings and learn from uh, the Global South uh, to improve our, our way of doing things. On communicable maternal, perinatal, and nutritional, we're learning from COVID that there's tremendous work that we have to do to build resiliency into supply chains. This is the intermediate case, but we have a foundation here for moving forward. What we need to do is scale it up and implement it effectively. And here, I think especially the private sector could be in service to non-governmental organizations and international institutions that have a mandate for addressing communicable disease especially. So the role for the private sector in each of these three categories is different. In injuries, uh, the role for the private sector, I think, is relatively well established and can be pursued. In non-communicable, we need a whole new way of thinking about private sector engagement. Clearly, elder care needs to be completely rethought in uh, the West and in the North and needs to follow principles that are much more prevalent in the global South. And then on communicable, maternal, perinatal, and nutritional, we have, uh, you know, uh, most of the architecture of uh, 
an effective healthcare system, we need some new institutions. I just recently wrote a paper in the Financial Times, a short article in the Financial Times on that. Yeah, yeah. And, and we need um, more innovation in our, in our uh, non-governmental and private sector uh, structurally to, to pull this off. But many of the structures that we have uh, need to be invested in and amplified as opposed to rethought from foundation. Toronto, with that, uh, maybe I can turn it back to you. Thank you. Uh, my pleasure. And these are awesome thoughts. These are also interesting times because, as Will rightly said in the beginning itself, a lot of these entrepreneurs in global health, given COVID-19, are getting pulled into solving COVID-19 as well, right? So I, I am chatting with a, a couple of them here in India. Uh, because of a supply gap issue or because they feel as like medical entrepreneurs, they should contribute to fulfill the gap that is there in the public system. So my first question to you to follow up on these slides, so both of you, uh, would be, uh, where do you see are the red herrings for the good work that has happened in private entrepreneurship and global health and the disruption in that equilibrium that may happen from COVID-19 and what would be your recommendations to policymakers and entrepreneurs be to make sure that the good work doesn't get jeopardized. And I'll come back to my other questions uh, once you guys respond to um, these, this particular question. Will? I was going to say, do you want to start? <laughs> I, have a, so, I have a couple of ideas. So, so there are, um, I think th there's a multi-layered question and there's so many different problems that we're seeing, you know, the pandemic is exposing our vulnerabilities in every sector, in every country uh, around the world. And so yeah. the answer to that question is almost uh, limitless. But let me just point to a couple of ideas that I hope are helpful. So the first is that I think we need to really reconceptualize our way of thinking about what our goals are in global health. Away from gap filling and away from, uh, you know, um, a, a, a charity model. Uh, that it, it, now, I want to emphasize that a lot of a lot of progress has been made, you know, on that model, and that those advances should not be abandoned. But as we think about the future and how we can make even more progress, as we all want, and especially against this disease, I think we need to not think about only more of the same kinds of activities that we've engaged in in the past but some new types of activities. And, and uh, for example, I have proposed that we create an international health stability board that would be complementary to the World Health Organization and analogous to the Financial Stability Board that would, go, that would work with uh, WHO and UN member countries and go in and provide analysis and provide feedback and work on health system strengthening and on coordination across countries and geographies in providing um, emergency capacity and other types of resilience when it's most urgently needed. Okay, similarly to what we see with financial institutions, which have been very successful uh, in implementing this kind of program subsequent to the 2008-2009 financial crisis. Great I point. also think we need yeah, I also think there's a lot more to talk about there, but I think we also need things like harmonizing of credentials for healthcare workers and so on, so that we can have more, um, more uh, reliable and consistent healthcare delivery across uh, geographies. Then down into the private sector, I think we need, um, we, we need to think differently about the, the structure of health supply chains and the ways in which those chains respond to health delivery uh, issues in the field. But um, more than anything, and we'll touch on this briefly, I just want to emphasize it, we need to make sure that those chains are very deeply, the innovations in those chains are very deeply informed by patient needs and by patient experience. Um, one of the tragedies of COVID has been uh, ventilation, ventilators. We know that ventilators um, were deemed initially as extremely important and they continue to be very important for um, uh, remediating COVID, advanced stages of COVID in vulnerable patients. But we also know that ventilation also is very dangerous. And so trying to think through how do we share knowledge across countries about that experience and inform health providers and make sure that, that those, uh, those insights are shared very, is very important. And 
we need better institutions and better sharing across sectors to, to accomplish that. And then there's lots to say also about NGOs, but uh, let me turn it over to Will at this point. Thank yeah, you, so great, great setup. I mean, let, let me play around a little bit within that framing. And, and, and think about both the needs at the point of care and the point, the touch points and the needs for coordination. And, and, and there has to be flexibility at the touch points and there has to be active coordination of the touch points. And, and so think about the, some of the, th and let's think about COVID. And some, think of some of the amazing activity that's taking place at touch points. And there's huge, huge failures across this system, but there's also some stunning successes. And the successes actually are happening more in the private sector than they are in the public. Yeah. Uh, they're happening with companies and nonprofits working together within countries, across countries, within sectors, across sectors. And at the same time as the political authorities are fighting at the, at the, at the political level across borders, we've got companies working in China, working together with companies in the U.S., working together with companies in Canada, working with, together with companies in the U.K. to develop vaccines, to develop treatments, to develop supports that they're using in multiple countries around the world. And the flexibility at the point of care in the private sector, both the nonprofit part of it and the for-profit part of it, is actually stunning. Um, I've been tracking um, corporate activity, uh, public, uh, private, private sector activity um, in COVID-related uh, treatments, um, uh, vaccines, support, uh, testing, and there are literally hundreds of companies around the world working on this that have down tools and are working both individually and in partnerships within their countries and across countries um, to address the problems. And they did this in a matter of days, in a matter of weeks, um, mm. and just stunningly quickly. Um, now, but you can't have a whole bunch of people working at points of care without some degree of coordination. And, and that's where the types of act board, and, and that's been the biggest failure, right? The biggest failure in COVID is not that people don't care, is not that people aren't working hard, um, it's not that people are trying, you know, in both the public sector and the private sector are trying to solve the problems. The biggest failure in country after country and across country after cross country is a lack of coordination. Yeah. And some of that's a political problem, some of that's an organizational problem. It may take a board at the time, the, the, a, 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 a quasi, you know, a, a multilateral board of the nature of the business that Anita's taking, talking about. It may take greater reliance on the WHO, on the UN, on others. It may great, take greater um, engagement of, of, of governments, um, but it's going to take, it, it will need that, degree, that, that coordination. But let me give you one example at the, at the, at the, at the, of how the private sector is doing it. Think about this, Gilead. And Gilead has one of the drugs now that, that at least has, is, is, seems to be showing at least some um, ability to, to ameliorate um, COVID needs. It won't be a full, full solution, but, but it does have promising science. And yeah. there's questions around pricing. And one of the ways that Gilead is dealing with the pricing is, is frankly to license it out at no, at no royalties to companies yeah. around the world in India and elsewhere um, to produce and sell. And this is a model that Gilead has used uh, for many of its HIV, AIDS, um, yeah. and hepatitis C drugs. Uh, where it has done low, low cost and in some cases no cost licensing um, in lower middle income countries. And so you get the, the skills, the technical skills, the organizational skills, the financial strength of, of, of private sector organizations such as Gilead Sciences being able to being brought to bear in many populations, many countries around the world. But again, it's not enough for it to be a bunch of independent comp companies or par partnerships of countries. There needs to be some degree of coordination and that in, in turn is going to take political goodwill um, to recognize that this is a that this this is a global pandemic, where mm -hmm. each of the local problems have huge impact on mm -hmm. on on other localities, and we're going to have to have political will to work together. Great points. Uh, sets me thinking on also some research questions, but I'll come back to that later. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, what I'm pondering, Will and Anita, is also the very curious organization. I was fascinated with it. You have structured the book as horizontal cases and vertical cases. And I can see why that may be so. And uh, working with some of these uh, private entrepreneurs in healthcare in India, I can see these specialization focus or a focus on solving the business model, etc. My question to you is, uh, what do you see happening in the medium term to these horizontal vertical combination over time and what might it do for welfare of patients and outcomes for patients? Um, and, and where did you get the idea of actually to structure this in the way that you did it? So if you could share some thoughts on that, that would, especially for those who want to go and read the book, I am, I'm reading the book right now. 
uh, it would be nice to know your thoughts here since you have a broad geographic um, exposure also in this context. So the North Star example that Will presented, I think, illustrates some changes that we may start to see uh, both within and around that 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 framework. So just to um, just to kind of build a little bit on on what Will had said, the, the focus on verticals is 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 the, the distinction between horizontals and verticals really reflects. The, the, the historical advance of science and specialized medicine and the opportunities for having large impact through verticals where you need a lot of resources and coordination uh, in order to be able to actually bring new insights into, uh, into healthcare delivery um, uh, as a result of, of scientific advances and of uh, advances in training and, uh, and, and so on here. Over time, the insights that are embedded in verticals tend to drift into horizontals. In other words, right. uh, something that's very specialized initially, a specialized form of care, once it becomes, uh, once becomes uh, sort of, uh, understood more fully through use and we get feedback on client and uh, patient experience and on um, clinical experience and so on, those protocols tend to be more, become more standardized and uh, more deeply understood and, be, and uh, the administration of them becomes integrated into the core of the healthcare curriculum in medical schools and so on. And so they become part of horizontal care. Now, that trend from vertical to horizontal is being amplified now by yeah. our understanding of things like social determinants of health and by uh, the kind of coordination coordinated responses that we need in order to overcome uh, the, the uh, fragilities of our systems in the pandemic. Now, so we have this sort of pressure to go horizontal um, that's emanating from mostly medical and medical management advances. Now, on the other side of that, we get pressure for more verticalization associated with value chain disintegration along the line that the North Star example mm. uh, illustrated. So North Star is acting as a coordinator. It is, instead of trying to do everything itself, it's working with partners. Those partners specialize. A lot of the specializations are not medical um, or not what we would uh, classically think of as medical. Things like, you know, trying to help patients with their legal problems and trying to help uh, patients overcome housing insecurity and food insecurity and things like that. But we have these vertical specializations and North Star orchestrates in order to be able to get all of those specializations to work. So what I see is a continuing relevance of vertical and horizontal, but a lot of change within that framework and an amplification of some of those, um, of, of those um, services, the services that are integrated, especially um, uh, first in horizontal and now uh, increasingly in vertical outside traditional healthcare delivery through hospital and clinical settings into things like, you know, housing and food security and sanitation systems uh, that envelop the patient and have a big uh, implication, education, have a big implication for how a patient uh, does over the course of his or her life. Excellent. Well, let, your thoughts. Let, me add, let me add to that briefly. I mean, Anita has touched really thoughtfully and effectively on the knowledge diffusion reasons for vertical and horizontal. Starting mm -hmm. with vertical going horizontal. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to stress an institutional pathology that forces that has caused us to, to start start vertically, and that's that most funding agents, whether public or private, start thinking about the verticals. They want to solve malaria. They want to solve HIV AIDS. They want to solve nutritional deficiencies. They want to solve a particular type of cancer, and so that's what they fund. And so the organizations that do the work need the funding, and so that's the work they do. And I suspect many people on this call have been in situations where they've had to fill out one report for one funding agency and a different report for a different funding agency and a third report for a third funding agency and have spending much of their time filling out reports that have massive duplication because each of those funding agencies is focusing on a different nuance, sometimes within the same vertical, sometimes different verticals. And so, yet the moment you touch the ground, right? The moment you mm -hmm. start working with people, um, you realize, and North Star is a great example of this, if you're going to work in the vertical of HIV AIDS, you've mm -hmm. also got to work in the vertical, you've also got to work in maternal and child health. You've also got to work in, 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 in job needs and career needs. Um, 
to really saw, even if you all you care about is the vertical, um, yeah. you have to be horizontal, you have to be linked in order to deal with the needs in that focal vertical. And so the, the opportunities are really to get out of the mindset and of, of saying we're, we, we will solve this problem by focusing on, on only this problem and looking for logical linkages. And the most successful organizations in our studies are really ones that have found ways of doing that. That re say rather than just saying, well, we're a heart hospital. Well, we're a heart hospital, but in order to do an effective job of, of cardiac care, we have to deal with maternal and child health. We have to deal with primary health care. And in order both to get people to the point of care most effectively and to help keep them from getting to the point of care. And that's the, and that's going to take, I think the people on the ground, the private sector organizations on the ground that really take to heart the idea of local context, of understanding the individuals, of understanding the communities, know that. Um, people on this call, you know this. Yeah. Um, and so the challenge is to get, to, to take our knowledge and bring that together with, uh, we, 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 and bring together the horizontal opportunities with our own financial skills and fundraising so that we get out of the, 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 the donation box, um, but also with, um, with funding agencies, with with and and re with regulatory agencies, um, that that also professionalize things with individual individual verticals and allow people to work across. That's one of the things we're learning with COVID. Mm -hmm. In mm -hmm. countries around the world, there are people who traditionally, under their licenses, can only do one thing. Mm -hmm. That are that are now allowed to do multiple things because of just a massive need. And if we can take this horrible situation and get some of the wins out of it, that's one of the wins we can get. Rather than forcing people back into their licensed verticals, um, take advantage of the fact that they've got mul they're, they're multi-skilled um, and use them horizontally uh, linked at the point of care. Very thoughtful, thank you, Will. Um, my last practitioner-oriented question, and I would like to wrap up thereafter with your thoughts on what are, what are the big research questions, because I anticipate some uh, research scholars also listening to us. Uh, so my last practitioner question is on digital health. Uh, since COVID-19 and even before, a lot of conversation on how do you digitalize health, which is a public good and solve the need gap. How do you see that evolving given your understanding across uh, horizontals and verticals and countries and different uh, disease contexts and business models? What's the future of digital health in the context of everything that is there around private entrepreneurship and global health. So we know that we we know that we have a case study in our um, in our uh, uh, book on mental health. Uh, we know that digital health, in terms of telehealth and health, uh, you know, uh, cont contact between patient and physician, can uh, often be very effective, and that there's a lot of opportunity uh, to try to provide people with good healthcare, advice, good healthcare, um, uh, diagnostic, uh, you know, protocols uh, through digitization. We also know that there's a lot of questions that arise from digital health uh, related to things like security and privacy and uh, so on that all need to be sorted out. There's, if you're thinking about the uh, level of individual health, I think there's also going to be fundamental questions about resource, uh, conveyance of essential resources once diagnostics take place. So that's the problem of the fellow on the airplane that I started with half an yeah. hour ago. Uh, yeah. You know, now I know you have COVID, how do I get you care? How do I get you medicine? And that's not, not you know, that doesn't change that much. So lots of um, uh, opportunities for improving diagnosis, pr improving follow-on care in terms of health delivery. But if you start to think about the patient as a whole person and move to community health, move to um, you know, things like, how do we deliver elder care better? How do we make sure that people have an adequate social support? How, there's a, a very, very large scope for innovation there. Um, if you can keep elders in their homes uh, longer, if you have used digital technology to sense and respond what is happening to that elder in real terms. Now, there's a lot of things that have to be dealt with in terms of privacy, but there's a tremendous capacity to keep people in their communities. Lots of things about mental health that we know can be improved. And then at the level of population health, uh, we have that uh, terrible um, challenge with Google flu uh, dynamics, yeah. I don't know, five, seven years ago or something like that, which really slowed uh, surveillance. COVID is now overcoming that. We see tremendous digital surveillance tools. Now, again, 
once we go big, it's like we go big, we don't have the, we don't have the small, we don't have the implication, we don't have the tools for contact tracing and testing that we would need, for example, mm -hmm. uh, to implement some of those insights successfully. It's all appeals to the public, to social distance and so on. So there's a lot of gaps here, but what we're seeing as we're reduced to staying at home from COVID, the, that the, we're seeing that the potential of digital to open up new areas of innovation is tremendous. It's just integrating digital with a kind of humane, socially rich, uh, patient-oriented approach to healthcare that is really, in my view, the fundamental challenge. Excellent. Will? Let's see, let me build on that. Um, the fundamental opportunities of digital have almost nothing to do with technology and everything to do with management and organization. Mm. We have the technology we need. We've had most of the technology we need for, for, for 60 years, since 19, the early 1960s. It's much better now than it was in 1961, but we basically have had the digital technology that we need to improve healthcare uh, for more than half a century. Um, the reasons we don't, that it hasn't diffused, whether it's in the traditional developed markets, whether it's in lower middle income countries, has very little to do with the technology and a lot to do with the politics, the organization, the lack of management, the barriers. So here's a simple example. Of, of um, and, and this is a developed market setting, but it's, it's relevant for, for any setting around the world. Duke University, where I do some work, in January of 2020, in February of 2020, had 100 virtual health visits per month, mm. every day. Two months later, it had several thousand virtual health visits per month. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it had nothing to do with new technology. What it had to do was getting inter, uh, the, 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 the clinicians inside the hospital willing to accept it, the payers willing to pay for it, and the licensors willing to allow people to do things by digital health that in January they weren't allowed to do. Yeah. In two months, from 100 to several thousand. And the thing that's fascinating, and I'm frankly not just fascinating, wonderful for me, is that some of the people leading that initiative were people who had graduated from a management program at run by run by Duke the Duke Medical System, mm -hmm. um, who were clinicians who had management skills, and were key players on the team. In fact, leaders of the team that took this this standing technology that had faced internal and external barriers for years, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and said, "We have to do it," and we're able to build a team, internal teams and external teams, to move it forward. And the cool thing is, they ain't going back. Mm. Post COVID, this will be in place. And this is true. This is so. This is true in North Carolina and the United States. It's just as true in Delhi and in, in, in India. Yeah. Um, so that's what I heard from the eye hospital whom I work with. Those kind of spikes, and they don't anticipate people going back. So absolutely. And again, it's not technology; it's management, mm. and the ability to overcome the the, the institutional barriers um, to the, that, that the management brings. Thank you, Will. So time to wrap up. I would request you guys to just overall point out the trade-offs, the big challenges, which potentially is also going to uh, feed into research questions. I'm sure um, students of strategic management, public policy, economics, and global health are listening to us. In your mind, what are the big questions to look out for in this context? Um, and, and to solve it both from a practitioner perspective and also from a retrospective perspective perspective as to what is the normative way certain firms, certain countries and certain um, policies and business models have worked. I, I know you, work, you may actually start off with the management of healthcare organizations issue. And as you were talking about this, I was reminded of Rafael Asadun and Nick Bloom's work. So yeah, I mean, I'll just turn it to you both and if you can share some thoughts on what are the big uh, questions out there that we need to understand better from a research perspective. You know, you have, you have some big questions in mind. Why don't you kick us off? Yeah, there's just some noise here. So I was hoping you could, uh, you could start us off well, but happy to do I've it got, if I've you need to. Too. I'm going I'm to okay. myself. <laughs> uh, all right. So uh, just, uh, I apologize to anyone who's listening who hears some ambient noise in the background. So um, there's, uh, there's no end to research questions that emerge from this. So first of all, there are tremendous uh, behavioral insights that could emerge from, uh, you know, our uh, experience of, of, of COVID that are very deeply rooted in our understanding of what health is and how people respond to information about uh, their health status. Uh, lots of questions about 
organizational identity and variation um, in how organizations respond and you know who they see as an essential worker and how we think about uh, essential work and um, and so on. Uh, th there's uh, tremendous work that needs to be done on global supply chains, medical supply chains, um, trying to understand resilience, trying to understand uh, the kinds of how to solve some of the kinds of coordination problems that we've already alluded to. Um, we, if our criteria move beyond only or primarily efficiency in the delivery of healthcare. And that mandate for efficiency, by the way, came from this place that I described earlier, which is that we really can't afford the healthcare system that we had previously, which was so siloed and so resistant to um, innovation, understandably in the name of uh, healthcare, but we're now forced now, I think, to uh, move into uh, uh, a, a new paradigm here. So we have new criteria for organizations of all types, including non-healthcare and healthcare organizations that emerge, for example, from the sustainable development goals uh, that allow us to uh, start to think about uh, how to move forward. So those goals, those 17 sustainable development goals are expressed at the highest level in very broad terms, no poverty, you know, um, uh, strong economic uh, growth. If you look underneath the uh, initial, the, the headlines on the 17 at the detailed goals and the way in which they're measured, there's a lot of nuance there and a lot of opportunity to see trade-offs between those goals. So for example, we see trade-offs between uh, uh, diag early diagnosis of COVID, for example, and privacy. So companies and private sector organizations more generally including nonprofits that can overcome those trade-offs that can innovate at the frontier of those trade-offs are going to produce tremendous value for society in our century i mean will and i have long said that you know as we mature in our careers we're not as interested in uh teaching kind of post-world war ii principles of um, monopolistic management and oligopoly and things like that anymore. We're really interested in how to overcome innovations that, uh, how to overcome barriers to innovation that could have an impact on the lives of many people that have not been enfranchised in the economy in the last 15 years, 20 years, uh, 60 years. So how, what are those trade-offs um, in, in performance criteria at the level of the SDGs and what are their implications for effective management in an organization? It, it's a research agenda that could keep us going for the next 60 years. Amazing, thank you, Anita. Over to Will uh, for the last word. Okay, well, as Anita said, I expect I'll be dead long before the research is done, um, which is okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm much more interested in management as it is and will be rather than as it was and, and what it needs to be going forward. And I think the part of the role of scholarship is to figure out what happened in the past, but a big part of the role of scholarship is to, to lay the base for what we do in the future. And, and you know, there's an infinite number of things we can look at here, but here's one thing that I think is critically important and certainly I'm spending time on it. And that's the notion of value chain integration that I talked about earlier, mm -hmm. because it's not enough within any system, uh, whether for private good or public good, to have a bunch of uncoordinated actors. We don't live in a Friedrich Hayek world in which a whole bunch of independent actors will magically make indip individual decisions and get to something, some combination of efficient and effective. There needs to be coordination, right? We see that in private Absolutely. supply chains, in consumer goods like Apple. Uh, we see that in, 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 in life sciences with companies like, like Gilead or like Pfizer and GlaxoSmithKline and lots of others coordinating active systems. And we see that we saw that with, with the example that we used with, with Northstar, um, that it's acting as a value chain integrator to pull together a whole bunch of organizations to line up their goals and deliver value to, the, to, to, to end consumers, to clients. And understand, so there's a huge research opportunity there to understand what the nature of value chain integration is, when it rise, what it rises, what makes it sustainable, what makes it break down, um, how it can work within, within industries, how it can work across industries, how it can work within countries, how it can work across countries, when is it relevant in private sector, when is it relevant in public sector, um, when is it relevant at the, the interface between public and private sector. Because as Anita said at the beginning, um, if we don't have coordinating a actors, mm -hmm. we, won't, we won't get anywhere near to what we need in terms of health. 
we, we just fundamentally need them. Otherwise, we've got a whole bunch of people running around like with like headless chickens, working their butts off, putting their lives at risk, as we see in COVID, and not getting anywhere near the benefit that we need. Um, and so a huge part of our re my research agenda is to try to understand what, what is the nature of organizations that are able to, to pull together domestic, global, multinational, private sector, public sector organizations and get them lined up with a common goal, a common purpose in a, in, or, in, or, in a sustainable, in a, in a sustainable long-term way um, to be able to deliver value to people who need it. Thank you. Much appreciated. And I wish to uh, also take this opportunity to thank you for your time today. Uh, this was an amazing conversation. I'm hoping everyone who listened to us will also gain a lot, both from an entrepreneurial practitioner perspective, from a management of healthcare organizations perspective, and also from a thought experimenting perspective to improve global health tomorrow. Uh, please stay safe, take good care, and hopefully we'll have you both sometime soon in India as things ease up a bit. Uh, thank you very much. Thank okay. you so much for having me. Thanks, Trent. I very much look forward to being back in India. I normally come several times a year, but right now my travel plans are a little bit delayed. <laughs> stay safe. Well, stay safe, Thank Anita. Bye-bye. You. you too. Thank you. Thank you.